Okay, share my screen. All right, today is March 7th, and we're getting close to the end of the term. This is our last week, and we have, we'll have lecture this week, both on Tuesday and Thursday, but there is no lab this week. Any questions about any of that? All right, this week we're covering chapter seven, and on Thursday, I hope to do a review. Uh, hopefully, I'll finish Chapter 7 today. Any questions about that? All right. The final will be Wednesday, uh, March 15th. It, it'll end at 8 p.m. So make sure you get it started sometime before 8 p.m. You can start as early as Tuesday night at 8 p.m. I'll check on that just to make sure. The final will have heavy coverage of the material since the last quiz. So about 50% of the questions will come from chapter seven, chapter 13, chapter 14, and lab module nine. Each of the other chapters will have at least one question on the final. And generally, most of them will have two. The exception is chapter one, which will have a little more questions from question, uh, chapter one. And the reason for that is because chapter one introduces a whole lot of topics that we went into greater detail in a later chapter. It also covers the history of microbiology, which is a topic that I like, and it, it just covers a lot of material in a very short amount of time. Any questions about any of that? All right. Any questions about how many quiz questions there are? All right. I'm curious about how many there are. All right. I think it's around 50. Let me check just to make sure that I'm correct about that. Close that down. You'd think I would remember, but I actually don't. Like I said, I'm an absent-minded professor. There will be two parts, a final A, which you do not need respond to this lockdown browser. It's short answer maybe a sentence or two, and then uh, final B, which requires Respondus Lockdown Browser. And where are the questions? Getting to it. I didn't see where that was on there. Hopefully you're not saying this I'm displaying the questions. Hmm. That still doesn't show it to me. I'm not <clears throat> sure where I got the numbers. It's got to be someplace in here. But I'm not finding oh, it. Oh, I found it. It's 45 on the Respondus one. Oh, Respondus. Okay, thank you. And then there's like three or four on the... Uh, practice quiz, or not practice, the quiz A, final A. All right, let me reshare my screen. And let's go to, uh, well, let me see. I don't think we finished chapter 13. I think we've got the few, last thing you talked about was coronaviruses. Yeah, I think we got about 10 slides to do. Yeah, I'm still got a little bit to talk about coronaviruses. Can you see my screen? 
Yeah, I yes. can see your screen. You can? Yes. Okay. Uh, I didn't hear the first person. So um, let me script that. So I discussed coronaviruses. We still have a little bit more to talk about them, but uh, uh, COVID-19 is also called severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 or SARS. Uh, Co-virus 2, and uh, that name is so confusing and so close to SARS that even scientists do not call it severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. Most people, including scientists, call it COVID-19. It is a virus which is closely related to bat coronaviruses, and it likely originated from bats. However, when they sequenced COVID-19, I'm talking about the original first COVID-19, it uh, showed recombination of two different bat COVID-19 viruses and then a pangolin virus. Only about 10% of the virus genome comes from pangolin uh, coronavirus. Pangolin is a spiny anteater, if you're wondering what a pangolin is. Uh, the pangolin is codes for the spikes of coronavirus. And I don't know if I mentioned this last time, uh, the picture that I have for the class, I thought was a cool picture. And I just chose it for the class long before COVID-19 ever uh, appeared to the world. And it uh, is a coronavirus, but it is not COVID-19 that I'm showing you. It is probably a coronavirus that causes the human cold. And that's what that is, the picture I selected for our class, which is appropriate because COVID-19 is now a worldwide pandemic. Uh, it's thought that uh, pangolins may have been the intermediate that the virus went into and lived in before it spread to humans. So it probably came from bats, recombined in bats, and then it either recombined in uh, with a uh, pangolin coronavirus, or maybe it, it infected the pangolins and then recombined with a pangolin coronavirus there before spreading to humans. The primary, prim, primary transmission of coronavirus is from droplets from coughs and sneezes within a range of about six feet. However, it can come from just breathing and it certainly can come from singing or talking. It may spread from indirect contact, meaning somebody could sneeze, I don't know, on their hands, touch a doorknob, somebody else can touch a doorknob, and then pick it up. If you pick it up on your hands, you have to inoculate the virus into a mucous membrane in your face. And coronavirus can spread that way, but it tends not to. It tends to spread directly from person to person or, you know, when they sneeze into the air and then the other person breathes it in. And that's actually a good thing because uh, colds and flus, the primary way we get them is by picking them up on our hands and then we inoculate ourselves. With COVID-19, we don't pick it up on our hands most of the time. You can, I'm not saying you can't do it that way, but most of the time it's spread directly person to person. Uh, coronavirus 19 can survive for three days on plastic or metal surfaces at room temperature or a day on paper or cardboard. So when you're worried about getting the virus and you're getting mail, what you can do is either open the mail right away and then alcohol or sanitize your hands or just let the mail sit for a day and then open the mail. 
Any questions about any of that? All right. Are the sim symptoms of COVID-19 are mostly flu-like? The runny nose and sneezing are less common than the flu, and shortening of a breath and deaths are more common. Mortality increases with age, ill health of the patient. Mortality is more common in men than in women. It's more common in Blacks and Hispanics than whites and Asians. And they're not really sure why Blacks and Hispanics uh, are more likely to get a severe coronavirus infection or die of it than whites and Asians. They don't know why that's the case. But that's actually um, seen in more than just the United States. The incubation period of COVID-19, it has to incubate two to 14 days from first exposure to when the patient first gets symptoms. However, about 50% of younger patients, I'm talking about children and young adults, will be asymptomatic. Well, they will carry COVID-19 and have no symptoms. And they can pass it to other people, like their grandparents. And then their grandparents get it and it kills them. Uh, the estimated death rate, these numbers are for... Um, this number, these numbers are a little bit out of date, but it was uh, estimated that between 0 0.0, 0 0.2 and 3% of people uh, died, and that the actual numbers when I last looked at it, which is about a year ago, was about 1.8% of people who got infected in the United States are dying. Uh, the number may be decreasing now because the newer variants have all been derived from, um, what was it called, omnivirus? No, Omicron, Omnicron. You can pronounce it both ways. Uh, and that was uh, um, a less lethal variant. You still can die from it, but you're just less likely to die from it. And I'm talking about the actual numbers for the time first of, of, of first exposure. If you've had coronavirus before or you've gotten the vaccine, your death rate will be decreased from these numbers. Any question about any of that? How to prevent getting coronavirus? Use correct hand washing is very important. And then keep your distance from people especially if they're coughing or sneezing. Don't touch your face. If you're sick, you should wear a mask and it's best to stay home. Don't spread it to anyone else. And of course, cough into your elbow or to tissue. And then uh, I guess wash your elbow and throw away the tissue. Any question about any of that? All right, that's enough for uh, coronavirus. Let me talk briefly about viruses and cancer. Some human cancer appear to be caused by viruses. And these are about 10 to 15% of human cancers. Cancers can be caused in one of two ways. Some examples of uh, Cancers that tend to be caused by viruses are cervical and skin cancer, or oftentimes caused by human papillomavirus. Obviously, skin cancer can also be caused by UV light. And then hepatitis B virus and hepatitis C virus tend to cause liver cancer. So if you have liver cancer, you might have had hepatitis B or hepatitis C virus. But not all cancers are derived or caused by viruses. For example, no breast cancer and glioblastoma examples are known, which are virally induced. 
Any question about any of that? All right. Uh, cancer is just uncontrolled cellular growth. Viruses can cause cancer in one of two ways. First, there can be the virus which integrates into the host cell's chromosome. This is the formation of a provirus where the uh, virus becomes a permanent genetic change in the cell, meaning that cell will contain the viral DNA for as long as that cell is alive. The viral DNA will be changed and that virus can insert in the middle of a gene, mutating the gene. Any questions about any of that? There are other things that can happen, such as changing the gene expression, but we're not going to get into that. Uh, just you don't want your DNA mucked around with a virus inserting at random. And uh, HIV, for example, a human papillomavirus, another one, uh, tends to insert in the DNA of our cells at random. And that just mucks up the DNA, which leads to the formation of a cancer. The second way a virus can cause a cancer is by an oncogenic virus. An oncogenic genic virus carries a gene that we call an oncogene. This gene is a mutated form of a normal cellular gene involved in cell growth. And it's mutated so that the gene, instead of causing normal cell growth, tends to cause uh, uncontrolled growth. So the oncogene helps transform the normal cell into a cancer cell. This gene can be transferred by an oncogenic virus. And then on top of that, if the oncogenic virus is inserts into our DNA, uh, that would you know, uh, make it two times more likely that the, uh, the virus will cause cancer because it's inserting into our DNA, mucking up the DNA, and it's carrying an oncogene. Any question about any of that? So once again, an oncogene is a gene that controls cellular growth, meaning it, it causes the cell to grow uncontrollably. Any question? All right, so those are the two ways that viruses can cause cancer. When we're talking about human viruses, we do have a lytic viral infection. We talked about that. And we talked about a budding viral infection. There's also Oh, actually, we haven't talked about a budding viral infection. I'll get to it, I think. Uh, or did we talk about it? I don't remember. Yeah, we did. All right. Uh, there's also a latent viral infection. A latent viral infection is a virus which infects a host cell. And while the virus is active and replicating, it is not latent. But then the virus can stop replicating, stop causing symptoms in the patient, and then just sort of hide out in the patient, not causing any disease. And this we call a latent viral infection, where the virus goes latent. The virus is inactive. The patient will be asymptomatic. It can last for a long period of time. While the virus remains in latency, it does not cause disease. And then the virus can come out of latency, start replicating, and uh, cause disease. Two examples of a latent virus are the cold sores, which when it's replicating, you have the cold sore, and then it go latent, and then a year or several years later, you get another cold sore where the virus came out of latency. And that's caused by herpes simplex virus type one. And the reason why it's called the cold sore is there's usually a stressor that causes the virus to come out of latency. And frequently, the stressor is a cold. 
and then you get the cold sore. Any question about that? A second example of a latent virus is when the patient comes down with shingles. Initially, when the virus first infected the patient, the patient will get the disease we call chickenpox. And that usually happens in childhood. And then the virus goes latent and it usually doesn't come out again for decades later. Usually when the child has grown up and is now an elderly grandparent and uh, the, the grandparent can get shingles, okay? Uh, it's thought that the stressor for shingles might be that the uh, patient's immune system weakens. And obviously the patient's immune system weakens with old age, but there are other stressors that can cause shingles to come out. Any question about any of that? Uh, if you don't know, after the child has chicken pox, they have no signs or symptoms until they get shingles. And of the children who, or any adult, I guess, that got chicken pox, about, let me see if I remember right, 15% uh, up to as many as 25% of the patient will get shingles. So not everyone will get shingles, but if you've had the chicken pox, you are at risk for getting shingles. If you had the shingles vaccine, you should, or not shingles vaccine, the, the chicken pox vaccine, you should not get shingles. Any question about that? The shingles vaccine is a special vaccine to help you prevent getting shingles. And it's only given to people who have had the chicken pox virus. So if you've had the chicken pox vaccine, I don't think they give you the shingles vaccine, but I'm not an expert on that. So I could be wrong. Any question about any of that? All right, there are persistent viral infections and what they are is similar to a budding virus, except they don't bud. They are a naked virus, which grows generally at low numbers in a patient. And then they leave the cell in a, a cell vesicle. They cause the persistent viral infection where the disease starts very mildly and the disease processes occurs over a long period of time, generally building up and getting worse with time. The virus, if it's a persistent viral infection, uh, is never cleared by the host immune system. It may be fatal. An example of this would be uh, AIDS virus, HIV. Uh, many uh, persistent viral infections uh, can be tolerated, like cytomegalovirus, varicella zoster, which is the chickenpox virus. My mother had this where she never got rid of the shingles. So she had shingles for the rest of her life when she first had shingles. Fortunately, she only lived, oh, I don't know, maybe four years after getting the shingles. A subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which is actually caused by the measles virus, may be fatal if it becomes a persistent viral infection. Any question about a persistent viral infection? All right, so normally in a viral infection, we get a period of time where you're not infected, so there's no virus in you. And then all of a sudden you get infected and the virus starts replicating and we call that an acute infection. And the virus will produce large numbers of viruses and then go away. You no longer have the virus. And very quickly, the virus infects you, 
reproduces, you produce a large number, and then very quickly it goes away. A classic example of a acute viral infection is the human cold. Okay, that differs from a persistent viral infection, which starts out very mild and it increases in viral load with time. And then over after a long period of time, the patient gets sicker. And you see how that graph was broken? The patient never recovers. So in this case, the patient died. That's why the graph is broken. The patient died from the persistent viral infection. That isn't always the case. Um, like I said, uh, um, cytomegalovirus can be a persistent viral infection and the patient tolerates it and it never blooms like that. It never, uh, it never blows up, gets much worse. So it just starts, it's slow, gradual worsening, but it never gets that bad while the patient is still alive. And they think with the cytomegalovirus that the patient and the virus have started uh, uh, making a balance, meaning the host immune system is attacking the virus, keeping its numbers down, and the virus is persisting, is not being wiped out, which uh, with the cold, for example, the virus goes away, probably is wiped out by the host immune system. A latent virus infection starts as an acute viral infection when the child has chickenpox, and then it's gone. So there's nothing here, no viral reproduction. And then it comes out. You notice the numbers are less in the latent infection. And that would be when the patient gets shingles. And then usually the virus goes away. Okay, you can have shingles more than once. But usually uh, most patients will only get shingles one time and it will go away. Any question about any of that? All right, if not, let's talk about prions. I'll try to be quick here. Uh, prions are proteinaceous infectious particles which cause disease. These proteins are inherited and transmissible by ingestion, by transplant, in an organ transplant, and by surgical instruments. They cause spongiform encephalopathy, which are vacuoles in the brain of the patient. And this happens in humans and in animals. Let me show you the encephalopathy. So there's a normal brain. And these are various uh, encephalopathies showing the vacuoles in the brain. And uh, we call it encephalop encephalopathy because that means the brain looks like a sponge. Okay, especially apparent here and here and a little bit there. In animals, we tend to call it spongiform encephalopathy, like bovine spongiform encephalopathy. And its more common name was mad cow disease. In sheep, we call it scrapies, which is a disease that sheep farmers in Europe have been dealing with for centuries. Okay, at least from the Middle Ages, we have records of sheep farmers every once in a while getting sh uh, sheep scrapies. And then cervid chronic wasting disease is another example. And humans, we tend to call it Kruxfeldt Jakob disease or Gerstmann Strauss Lauser Schneckner syndrome. And I could really be butchering that. I'm not German. And then fatal familia insomnia and Kuru. These are all diseases caused by prions. Uh, let's talk a little bit about. Kuru. Kuru was a disease seen in the Four tribe in Papua New Guinea, which is this region of Papua New Guinea in red. Uh, the patient 
was unable to walk, had lost the ability to swallow or chew, drastic waste loss. The patients um, became, what do you call it, had dementia and got worse and worse and eventually led to death. Okay. Uh, how was this disease spread? Well, the four tribe had an unusual funeral ritual where they cooked their dead and then ate their dead relatives. And this, uh, one of the early relatives, I guess, uh, had got Kuru, and then it was spread by people eating people, their dead relative. Okay. Uh, the protein is most often seen in the nervous tissue, so the brain would be the worst tissue to eat. But as you know, the nervous system has neurons or nerves running to other places in the body, including the heart and the muscles. But the brain and the spinal cord would be the worst part to eat. Uh, fortunately, women in Papua New Guinea and the Four Tribe noticed that uh, Kuru was happening in their children as well as among themselves. And so women by themselves uh, stop feeding their dead to their children. And so they made the Kuru much less frequent. However, the men still involved, still ate their dead relatives. And then the missionaries came to Papua New Guinea and they uh, weren't, uh, what do you call that, uh, insulted by this and thought it was anathema and they st stumped it out. They refused to allow the, the four tribe to eat their dead. And that actually got rid of Kuru in the four tribe. Any question about any of that? So in one case, the intolerance of the missionaries actually did the people something good. And that's my own opinion, so don't quote me on that, by the way. Uh, I've already showed you the brains of uh, patients who have encephalopathy. Uh, the mechanism how the uh, prions replicate is there's two forms of the protein. The PRP uh, hyperscript C is the normal cellular protein which is needed by the cell, especially the nerve cell, on the cell surface. So it's a normal protein on the surface of a cell. The other form of the protein is PRP, uh, what do you call that? Not hyperscript, but uh, uh, superscript SC. And this is the scrapies form of the protein or the prion form of the protein, okay? How the prion protein replicates itself is the prion protein, well, well, uh, <laughs> I guess I jumped ahead a little bit, we'll go on with it. The prion protein comes up to the normal protein, the PRPC form, and then induces it to fold into the prion form, the PRPSC form, meaning the cell now will have two prion proteins in it. And let me state that the PRPSC form is the same amino acid sequence as the PRPC form. The only difference is the folding pattern of the protein. The two proteins, the C form and the SC form, are in a different folding pattern. Any question about any of that? So it is the same protein, it's just in a different folding pattern. Anyways, the cell will notice it doesn't have enough of the normal protein, the C form, and so it'll translate more. But the trouble is that cell has two copies of the uh, prion form. And if either one of them comes up to the C form, it'll make more scrapies protein. And then the scrapies protein 
accumulates in the nerve cell, such as accumulating the brain cell, start forming plaques, encephalopathy, and then cell death will eventually occur. Any question about any of that? So that is how a prion can cause disease. And like I said, you can get the SC form, the prion form from eating it or from getting injected, injected into a patient or surgically transplanted like on the surgical blades. Or if you're given an organ transplant, you can get the prion protein in you. I'm not sure how the prion protein moves around. Like if you had a heart transplant, how does the prion protein move around? The prion protein must move around because the patient gets a prion disease, meaning it gets to the brain. So the prion protein must move around. I don't know how that happens, but it must. All right, any question about prions? If not, let's talk briefly about uh, plant viruses and viroids. Plant viruses resemble animal viruses in many ways because animal, I mean, plant diseases that are of economic importance to crops, like diseases among beans, corn, sugarcane, potatoes, because of the tough cell wall of the plants, the plant viruses typically enter the plant cell via a wound in the plant, such as being eaten by an uh, insect or a nematode, or by a fungal infection, damaging the plant. Uh, plant viruses can uh, uh, spread from plant to plant by pollen or seeds, as well as uh, the virus can obviously be spread by insects or by cattle if they eat the virus and then what the cattle eats or the insect eats, as well as it could be spread by wind. But like I said, the virus cannot infect a healthy plant. You have to damage the plant before the plant can be infected. Any question about that? We're not going to talk much about plant viruses because... They don't infect human cells, and this class is focusing on viruses and other diseases which cause human diseases. All right, let's briefly talk about uh, uh, viroids. Viroids are naked RNA molecules that cause disease. So you can think of them as a virus lacking the protein coat, meaning an RNA virus lacking the protein coat. And then it's a naked piece of RNA, which causes disease. And it gets inside the cell, uses the cell to replicate itself, to make new viroids, and then spreads from that cell. Fortunately for humans, as well as animals, there are no viroids known in any animal cells. So viroids are only known in plant cells. Okay. They do have a, a viroid known in fungal cells. You don't need to know that. And it's not called a viroid. It's called something else, but it's similar to a viroid. So viroids are something you only have that cause disease among plants. And an example of a viroid is uh, when uh, uh, the viroid causes stunting in potatoes, where the potato will be a smaller potato than, than a normal sized potato. Any questions about viroids or Uh, viroids or uh, viruses.
Let's see if I can find it. Oh, there's a picture. Uh, so there's a normal potato, I assume, on the left there. And then this here, uh, a potato and that one too, where it's stunted by uh, um, the viroid. Any question about any of that? So there's a normal potato and these are stunted potatoes. That's a better picture. I should actually save that one. All right, if there's no questions about that, let's move on to uh, chapter seven. Whoops, let's go on there. All right, chapter seven is the control of microbial growth using things like uh, disinfectants and antiseptics. This is a topic that students have an easier time with, which is one reason why I have it at the end of the term, because most of you kind of already know at least the background for the, this topic. Uh, know the terms sterilization, disinfection, antisepsis, deserming, sanitization, autoclaving, pasteurization, and what's a biocide or a germicide. Be able to discuss the factors that influence microbial death rates. Three, be able to discuss the three main ways in which an antimicrobial agent kills or inhibits bacterial cell growth. Four, understand the various types of disinfectants and how they work. And five, understand the relative resistance of the major microbial groups to antimicrobial agents. Any question about what we're gonna be doing? All right, let me blow this slide up. The microbial death rate is shown here or there and bacterial populations tend to die at a constant logarithmic rate when they are heated or treated with an antimicrobial chemical, meaning that uh, we have one log killing per unit of time. So that means that if we have a population of a million cells, 90% of those cells will die upon exposure to the antimicrobial agent in one unit of time or one minute. And then 90% of those will die after two minutes. Any question about any of that? So if we had a million cells after one minute, we only have 100,000 cells. After two minutes, we'd only have 10,000 cells. And then etc down to six minutes where our million cells will be down to one cell. That is a constant log decrease. And we like to graph it on a log scale over an arithmetic time scale, because then we have a straight line, a log decrease, y equals mx plus b. If we were to graph it on an arithmetic scale, the graph would go like this, and then start to plateau out. It would eventually come down to zero, like someplace down here would six minutes, it would be close to zero. You're at one cell right there. Any question about any of that? So the main point here is for more cells, you need more time to kill off all of those cells. That's the main point of this, as well as that the death rate happens logarithmically at a constant rate. Uh, when we're talking about the microbial death rate, the effectiveness of the antimicrobial treatment will depend on four different characteristics. First, I already mentioned it, 
the number of microbes present at the beginning will depend, will determine how long you must treat the uh, area to get rid of all of the infective agents. The longer, I mean, the more cells present, the longer you have to treat. Environmental influences can affect the treatment. For example, the presence of organic matter tends to decrease the treatment effectiveness. A good example is with bleach. You're bleaching something and you come across, I don't know, something with a lot of organic matter. The organic matter will inactivate the bleach. And so now your wash rag will no longer be effective at uh, killing off the microbe. Oftentimes, hospital specimens will have organic matter around them. And so you have to remember that the presence of organic matter may inactivate your uh, disinfectant or antiseptic antisepsis, sorry, whatever. The temperature of the treatment can affect the microbial death rate. Generally speaking, the higher the temperature, the better the cell killing, meaning the less time you need to treat the cells for. The presence of biofilms can also affect the microbial death rate. If the cell is inside of a biofilm, it will be much more difficult to kill. If you're treating it, you'll need to treat the cells for a much longer exposure than you would for the same cell without the biofilm. Any questions about any of that? The time of exposure will affect the microbial death rate. Generally with more cells, you need a longer time of exposure. And we already talked about that. And then there's microbial characteristics that can affect the microbial death rate. For example, mycobacterium has lipids in its cell wall. And so if you're treating the cells with a aqueous disinfectant, meaning a disinfectant that dissolves in water, that disinfectant may not get inside the cell and kill the cell. So you'll have a harder time killing the cells because the mycolic acid of myco uh, mycobacterium is protecting the cells. There's just various characteristics. We'll talk more about the various characteristics near the end of this lesson. All right, this slide is showing you some different terms. You know what sterilization is, the destruction and removal of all forms of microbial life, including endospores. There is an exception to that, and prions may not be included in the sterilization because it's really difficult to kill prions. I never mentioned that, but to kill prions, you need to heat the prions to around a thousand degrees Fahrenheit, or maybe it's a thousand degrees Celsius, which is really, really hot. And we don't quite understand why is that prion protein so resistant to treatment, such as heat? You actually have to start charring the bacteria cells to kill off the prion. Commercial sterilization, sufficient heat to kill endospores, such as Clostridium botulinum, botulinum, and this is used in canned foods to prevent the spread of botulism. Disinfection is to destruct the vegetative pathogens by a chemical. It does not kill endospores. So many endospores can survive disinfection. 
there are a few examples and we'll talk about a few cases of a disinfectant which can kill endospores. Antisepsis is the destruction of vegetative pathogens on living tissue. Usually this is a chemical and the antiseptic chemical is less harsh and I guess a little less efficient at killing than a disinfectant. Uh, bleach is something that we mostly use as a disinfectant. And then iodine is an example of an agent we use as a, an antiseptic. Degerming is just the removal of microbes from a limited area, such as when you alcohol the skin before giving an injection. We're not really applying antis an antiseptic there. Alcohol is too weak to be an antiseptic but we are applying a degerming agent and that decreases the bacteria in the area we're going to inject, but it does not remove all of them. And then sanitization, treatment intended to lower microbes to safe levels, such as uh, when uh, treating eating utensils or eating plates, and that's usually done in the uh, uh, the restaurant industry. Any question about any of that? All right. A biocide or a germicide is a substance that kills microbes. It may not kill endospores and certainly doesn't kill prions, but it does kill other microbes like bacteria fungi. Bactericides is an agent that kills bacteria. Fungicides, an agent that kills uh, fungus. Viricides is an agent which inactivates a virus. Any question about any of that? Bacteriostasis is the inhibiting the growth of the microbe but that does not kill the microbe. It just prevents its growth. Once you re remove the biostatic agent, growth might resume. When we, we talked about this uh, bacteriostasis with antibiotics, if there is an antibiotic which is bacteriostatic, it will prevent the growth of the microbe and it's relying on the host immune system to remove the microbes because the antibiotic will not. Any question about any of that? And there are bacteriostatic chemicals as well. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but there are bacteriostatic chemicals. Uh, the most common examples would be a bacteriostatic antibiotic. And I don't know of any, but um, I know penicillin family and uh, cytomyxin B is uh, two examples which are bactericidal, but I actually don't know of any antibiotics off the top of my head which are bacteriostatic. Any question about any of that? And I don't know of any chemicals that are bacteriostatic either. Uh, sepsis is a term to refers to microbial contamination of the blood. It only refers to microbes in the blood. That differs from uh, bacteremia, which means the bacteria are growing in the blood. Uh, sepsis refers to Microbial contamination. Asepsis is the absence of contamination by unwanted organisms. You've learned aseptic technique now in the microbiology lab. So when you go out 
into your career, if you go in the allied health field, make sure you practice aseptic technique always when you're handling a microbe or you, you've handled the patient. Aseptic techniques are especially important in surgery to minimize the contamination from the instruments, the operating personnel, the patient, and the air. And then that will minimize the infection that comes from the surgery. When they first did surgery before aseptic technique, about 50%, a major surgery, I should say, about 50% of the patients died. And almost all of those patients died because of a bacterial or a microbial infection. The death rate dramatically decreased once we started using aseptic technique in our surgeries. Any question about any of that? All right, if there's no questions, let's move on to another topic, the action of microbial control agents. Antimicrobial agents kill or inhibit microbes by one of three ways. You can alter the membrane permeability, such as damaging, damaging the plasma membrane, either the lipids or the proteins of the plasma membrane, and then causing the contents of the cell to escape the cell, leading to the cell's death. Polymyxin B is an agent, it's an antibiotic that uh, damages cells this way. It puts a hole in the cell and then the uh, cell dies. Now, polymyxin B is an antibiotic. There are chemical agents that damage a cell this way. One would be alcohol. It can dissolve the cell membrane if you're applying enough alcohol to a bacterial infection, you'll, you'll start dissolving the cell membrane and that will kill the cells. Now, uh, alcohol can kill the cells in other ways, such as the second way, damage to intracellular proteins. If you have a chemical or other agent which denatures the proteins, especially the enzymes, then you'll keep that protein from functioning and then the cell may die. Like if you damage all of the cell's enzymes with alcohol, you will kill the cell because the cell needs the enzymes to function. And that's another way that alcohol can kill cells by damaging the proteins in the cell. But alcohol also dissolves the cell membrane. Uh, alcohol can dissolve lipids. And as you know, the cell membrane of animals, as well as anything, is mostly a phospholipid. Any question about those two ways? The third way a um, antimicrobial agent can kill or inhibit uh, the cell's growth is by damaging the nucleic acids. For example, if you expose the, ant, um, expose the microbes to x-rays, the x-rays will damage the nucleic acid within the cell, leading to mutations, which could be a fatal mutation and then kill the cell. Any question about any of that? Oh, here's another antibiotic which actually damages proteins. And is that the protein part? Well, it's a peptide. Um, penicillin and all members of the penicillin family uh, get in the crosslinks of the peptides and prevent the crosslinks from forming which can lead to death of the cell. Any question about any of that? 
And penicillin G targets the disulfide bridges. Is that right? Actually, that's not right. Sulfide bridges are hydrogen bonds, which will denature the protein. That's what we're talking about. All right, if there's no questions, let's move on. Uh, let's talk about the physical methods of controlling microbes. We can control microbes by applying heat, uh, filtration, which is a special treatment, low temperatures, high pressure, desiccation, osmotic pressure, which results in the same thing as desiccation, and then radiation. These are physical methods to control microbes. There are also chemical methods, and we'll talk about them later. Heat is one physical agent that can control microbes. All methods of heating kills microorganisms by denaturing proteins and enzymes. Though if you apply a high enough heat, such as flaming or incineration, you actually turn the cells into char. So you're doing much more than just damaging their enzymes. You're actually turning the cell into char. There's two types of heat, wet heat and dry heat. Wet heat would be like boiling something. A more efficient wet heat would be autoclaving or even just steaming, steaming the microbes that will kill them. Dry heat is uh, what we do when we bake an item, we use dry heat. So when you're baking something in the oven, you're using dry heat. But flaming and incineration are also dry heat and they're at elevated temperatures. And like I said, they usually kill the microbes by turning them into char. All right, moist heat is like putting something in boiling water. Moist heat does denature, coagulates proteins and enzymes. Like when we have the egg white coming out of an egg, it's clear, but when we cook the egg white, it will denature, and then we have the whites of our egg. Uh, an example, exact example of that would be taking egg whites and putting them into boiling water, like with a poached egg, that would be exactly moist heat denaturing the proteins. Boiling or using steam kills vegetative bacterial pathogens. Most viruses, most fungi and fungal spores, when you apply the boiling temperature for 10 minutes, Often it's much faster, like if you just bring a solution up to a boil and then turn it off, that would kill E. coli. E. coli is not very good at surviving many things, such as heat. However, the moist heat may not kill an endospore, and some viruses may take a long period of time to destroy with most moist heat. For example, some endospores and some viruses can survive over 20 hours in boiling water. So they would be killed if you have a long enough exposure, but generally we never boil something for 20 hours. Generally, it can be done. So reliable sterilization by most heat requires temperatures above boiling. And how do we do that? We use a giant pressure cooker that we call an autoclave. An autoclave puts the steam under pressure. It's very effective. And then we use a fairly high temperature, 121 degrees Celsius. Remember 100 degrees is the temperature of boiling water. So it's a little bit warmer than boiling water. And with that temperature, we get sterilization, at least of microbes, 
after 15 minutes in the autoclave at 121 degrees and 15 pounds per square inch. So in about 15 minutes, you kill everything except for endospores, some resistant viruses. All right, any question about any of that? All right, Louis Pasteur developed pasteurization, which is treating something that's usually a liquid, although you can use it with a gas or a solid, treating the substance with a high enough temperature for a short period of time where the virus, not the virus, the treatment kills most microbes, but not all microbes. And this we call pasteurization. Mild heating, sufficient to kill organisms that cause disease or spoilage, but it does not kill all microbes. There's a problem with this, and that is if we have an organism which is thermoduric, meaning heat resistant, it can survive pasteurization to go on and cause disease. But uh, the thermoduric organisms are unlikely to cause disease or even for that matter, uh, spoilage, at least in the common units, common substances, which are subject to pasteurization. And that would be mainly milk and beer and other liquids. But pasteurization can happen to other substances. A pasteurization has two treatments. You can treat the substance you're wanting to pasteurize you can treat it to 63 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. Or in the American industry, you can treat it to 72 degrees Celsius for 15 seconds. And in the American industry, most pasteurization happens uh, with the latter, 72 degrees Celsius for 15 seconds. For example, most milk is treated that way. Any question about pasteurization? Like I said, it was a process started by Louis Pasteur and he actually invented it to prevent beer from getting a microbe to grow in it. And then uh, that microbe makes the beer less desirable. And so the beer industry went to Louis Pasteur and said, can you help us? And he did. He found that uh, um, microbes get into things from the air just by dropping out of the air. And then the microbe can be pasteurized, which would kill many microbes, not all microbes. But usually it kills the microbes capable of causing human disease. And like I said, there's two treatments that pasteurization can have. There's a third treatment, which is not paralyzed pasteurization. It is actually sterilizing the milk. So milk can be sterilized if you heat it to 140 degrees Celsius for around one second. And this is called ultra high temperature milk or UHT milk. This milk can stay in the store, enclosed in its container for months, probably for years before it'll spoil. That is not true for pasteurized milk because pasteurized milk does not kill all microbes in it. It does not kill some non-human pathogens, but it does kill, or at least tend to kill, human pathogens. Any question about any of that? So ultra high temperature milk 
is not pasteurization. Treatment of a substance such as milk at 63 degrees Celsius for 30 seconds or 72 degrees Celsius for 15 seconds is pasteurization. All right, any questions about liquid heat? If not, let's talk about dry heat. And this cat is showing you that dry heat is not as efficient at killing microbes as wet heat. For example, the cat has climbed into the warm oven because it likes warm temperatures, but the cat is not being harmed, it's still alive. And the cat would never climb into boiling water because the cat couldn't survive that. Another example is you can put your hands into a hot oven, pull out the cookies. Obviously you have to have a uh, heating pad to prevent from burning your hands on the pad, the uh, container. But my point is you can put your hands into the hot oven for a short period of time and you will not get burnt. And that's showing you that dry heat is not if, as efficient as wet heat that wet heat is much more efficient at transferring the heat. And so generally, if we're using wet heat, you don't have to expose the substance for as long as the heat as when you're cooking it by baking. Uh, dry heat tends to kill things by oxidation. But remember, flaming and incineration actually kill cells by turning the cell into char. So which method is more efficient with regard to time at killing cells, wet heat or dry heat? Anyone? Wet heat. Heat. Much more efficient. Usually boiling for 10 minutes will kill all vegetative cells. And to get all of the vegetative bacteria dying from dry heat, you have to expose to the dry heat around 170 degrees Fahrenheit for two hours. Wet heat is at 100 degrees Celsius and 10 minutes tends to kill all vegetative cells. Okay, so wet heat is much more efficient than dry heat. Any question about any of that? All right, filtration is when we take a liquid or a gas and we pass it through a filter and then the sterile substance that goes through the filter will be sterile, meaning the substance that goes through the filter will be sterile. Filtration removes microbes from liquids and gases. You can filter for something smaller, like a virus, but then you must use a special filter with very tiny pores, and it will take usually longer for the liquid to get through a tiny pore than to get through like a face mask with a, uh, or another filtration with a larger pore. So filtration only happens to liquid and gas. You can't filter a solid. Generally, we filter liquids. I'm not aware of any gas we do filter, but it's possible. And then you collect that in a sterile container underneath the filter. And then you cap that and, and that what's inside the container is now sterile, at least with vegetative cells. Uh, filtration usually stops endospores. So it does sterilize for endospores as well. The exception would be if you used a really large pore and you're filtering cells that have very small uh, bacteriophages. Uh, filtration is often used for liquids that we do not want to alter 
the taste, the texture, or the nutrients of the liquid. Like Coors beer, if you don't know, tastes different than most other beers because most beers are pasteurized and Coors is, is treated by a filter, meaning the beer is sterilized by a filter and then it, the can is sealed or the liquid is put into a can, I guess, and then the can is sealed and uh, the, uh, the can will not have the microbes because of filtration. Uh, some juices are filtered instead of heated, and that's generally to pre preserve the flavor and the looks. Some, most vaccines are actually filtered by fil uh, filtration. We don't apply harsh chemical agents and uh, radiation to vaccines because you can disrupt the chemical bonds in the vaccine and then the vaccine would no longer work, at least those with disrupted bonds. Anyone have a question? Uh, milk is a product and beer are products. Our milk is usually not filtered. Beer and juice may be filtered. Milk is usually not filtered because the uh, large proteins and the lipids in milk will clog the filter. All right, this will be our last time we talk about it, and then we will continue with this next time. Uh, low temperatures do not usually kill the microbe, but they prevent the microbe from growing. So it inhibits microbial growth. This could be a refrigeration temperature between zero and seven degrees, slowing the metabolic rate of most microbes. The microbe will not reproduce or synthesize a toxin at refrigeration temperatures, but you should realize that psychotrophs can reproduce at these temperatures and they will reach numbers of greater than 2 million within a week. And that's why when you treat a food by boiling or something like that, you can keep it for a week, but after a week, you should throw it out. And that's because the psychotrophs can grow in it. Freezing will stop the metabolic activity. It may not kill all bacteria, in fact, about 50% of the bacteria in a population can survive freezing and then thawing, but about 50% of the cells will die. I'm talking about bacteria cells. How freezing kills cells is it forms ice crystals, which can kill some bacteria, and it does kill all parasitic species, meaning like all parasitic eukaryotic worms will be killed by freezing. This is freezing in your home freezer, by the way. Quick freezing and liquid nitrogen does not kill most cells because quick freezing and liquid nitrogen does not allow the water to form ice crystals. And without forming the ice crystals, you don't kill the cell. So the ice crystals are actually killing the cell probably by ripping a hole in the cell. Any question about any of that? If not, I'm gonna stop here. And uh, if there's no questions, I'm not gonna show up for the lab because uh, there is no lab this week. All right, I'll see you on Thursday. Oops, wrong one.